Welcome, everybody. I'm Jonathan Marsh. I'm the Vice President of Strategy for WSO2. And we wanted to kick off today with our CEO and, and founder, uh, Sanjeeva Wirawana. Uh, and we've been doing WSO2 on an open source model since the very start. Uh, what was it when we founded WSO2 that really attracted you to the open source model? All right. Thank you, Jonathan. So open source, um, for me, predates WSO2. It was a it was an approach that allowed us to say we can set up it, create we can create some technology and get it out to the wider market, get it out to the broader community, while being a nobody, and you create a better technology and somehow reach the broader market. And really, because that was proven by then with Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, had shown that a small group of people creating a really good piece of technology could become a dominant technology that overtakes the largest vendors in the market. And at the time, we were going up against IBM, Oracle kind of companies with the enterprise technology leaders. So how do you compete with IBM? I mean, you're nobody. Now you're dealing with a company that's a hundred billion dollars revenue. You have no credibility, no reputation, no brand, nothing. So open source was the way in which we said, well, we'll create something and we'll give it away all three. And if we can build a better product and it's free and anybody can use it and there's no nonsense, people will come. That's how we got started. And so with a small team, how do you develop great products and better products with open source compared with the huge resources that a commercial vendor can put behind their R and D. I mean, that, that's a great question. So, and and the key to that is really the fact that open source is about standing on the shoulders of giants. So, when you build an open source product, you never, you don't, you don't write everything from the hardware upward on the software step. Whereas an enterprise, a closed source vendor that doesn't want to use other people's software has to do that. So, we currently use maybe 300, 400, maybe even more open source libraries underneath. So that's, I don't know how many person years of work there is, but probably millions of person years of work that have gone into creating this stuff over the decades. And we just sit on top of it and create additional value, which people can sit on top of. So the way you compete is now we are not competing with a large established player with just a few people you have relative to their size, but you are bringing the best technical brains of the entire world on the open source side of the world and packaging it all up and creating some new value, bringing your own intellectual capacity to it. So you are, you are not a small guy anymore in that picture. Mm -hmm. I know we have some incredible engineers who have joined WSO2. What's really the role of open source in attracting that kind of talent? Yeah, so th there are many aspects to that. Uh, open source, so, uh, from a personal brand development perspective, every line of code I write in WSO2 is publicly visible to everybody. If you work in a non-open source company uh, whose technology is not open source, when you join the company, you disappear. You become part of the company, you might get a great salary, but your work is not visible. In fact, this goes back to when I finished my PhD and I was looking for a job, I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. My PhD advisor, his advice was, um, if you're going to, whatever you go to, go to a place that doesn't let you get lost. He was an academic, right? So in academia, it's all about individual brand because you write papers, you build the brand, it's completely individual brand. Whereas in a company, it's all company brand, zero individual brand. Academia, no company brand for the most part because a high-end professor from, from Purdue, from MIT, can go to another university and they carry their entire brand with them for the most part. A little bit of, obviously, environment brand, right? But when you're in a company, if you work for a big brand name company, if you not, if you don't have any kind of open source stuff, you are, you are just that company. You can only it just shows that you had some period of employment there. In WSU, you can show what you've done, right? And the other part is because we have a, a an, because we build on other open source stuff, you also get to participate in other communities, openly. So you build an individual brand on a global basis in various places. As hey, these guys are doing something. These people know what they're talking about. It's kind of like open standards, basically how we met people, right? Open standards was a way in which we were able to meet people across the industry and collaborate and create something and build networks, build relationships, and so forth. So back when we started, you mentioned like MySQL and the Apache server and Linux were all coming on, and it was really clear 
how valuable open source was to the industry and to the community at that point. I mean, we moved on a lot. I and mean, is open source still as important as it was? Um, so yeah, I think there's been a lot of um, a lot of evolution of the software stack over the last uh, two decades, essentially that we've been we've been working at it. Today, cloud has taken over a lot of where software is delivered. So in in a software, when software is delivered as a service in the cloud, where is the source code? What language is it written in? Where is it running? I don't care, right? I just need the service and it works. And and it as as long as it works perfectly or to the level that I'm expecting it to work, I don't know anything about it, right? So on one side, you could argue that that has meant that the need for open source has gone down. At the same time, open source is also, a software is now an integral part of every aspect of life. There's nothing that drives without software. So that means it's an essential part of independence of a company, of a, of a, of a country, of any entity that is operating because if you build only on cloud services, you have no control over it because they can turn the switch off anytime they want or give you change. If they want to turn the switch off, they'll just change the price on you or change the terms of service. Say, well, we're now gathering this data that we won't gather in the floor, whatever the changes are. So open source has a big relevance yet in, in many aspects of the fact that software is something that you need to have some degree of control over. But at the same time, just as much as we build on a bunch of underlying stuff, and those things build on other things underneath, the need for control moves up the food chain a little bit. As time goes along, more of it is commodity. You just say, you know what, I need a database engine, I need a this, I need a that. And you can plug those in to a great extent. So it gives a way to keep on building up the stack, and open source still plays a very important part in that. So we've been working for the last few years on more SaaS solutions of our own. So by going into SaaS and providing functionality there, does that weaken our commitment to open source? Uh, no, because we are, we are continuing to do both sides uh, equally. So what we're doing on the open source side is saying we are creating technology that our customers can use to put together their digital infrastructure, their digital platform. And most of our customers today are doing it that way. And so from our perspective, we are truly committed to open source. We have been 100% open source from day one. We've been Apache licensed from day one. We are not going to change any of those things. We just keep on chugging along and we'll continue to do this. And there's a segment of the customer base that always will want that kind of control and freedom that it delivers. Then on the SaaS side, our product primarily, so we have two SaaS products, Ascardio and Corio. Ascardio is very much a identity access management product, but it's very much the open source product available as a service. So really it is open source. It's just that some people are like, you know, I don't want to deal with this stuff. I don't want to get involved with managing usernames, passwords, and security credentials for my customers. You guys deal with it. Ascardio can do that for you. Right. So that's for deployment. That's really just a deployment choice. For all practical purposes, it's a deployment choice. Corio, on the other hand, is not at all like the other things that we do. Corio is very much a enterprise software engineering and delivery platform. So it covers the problem of saying, hey, I want to just write code. I'm a business, I'm a retail company, I'm an insurance company, I'm a manufacturer, and I need to create stuff that works at my level of interest, not put focus on everything under the table that keeps me and gives me the power to do that. And Corio says, no problem, you get your developers, just add developers to Corio, write the code, come into a repository, and boom, we'll take over and do everything to get it up and running for you. So it's not just code, it's an entire system yeah. that goes into the platform operationally, data. That's right. All the other aspects that are That's right. you can package up necessarily easily as open source, yeah. downloadable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yet we, we try to maintain the, the philosophy and the principles behind the company, even the way we've done that, the way in which we have done Corio, because we say, well, the control plane or the part of Corio that takes your code and builds it, packages it up, sets it up for execution in the operating environment is what we do as a service, but it runs actually on your own infrastructure, right? The infrastructure can, of course, be hosted by Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Oracle or IBM or any cloud provider, or could be in a box underneath in your basement with the data center that you have. We don't mind either way. We are not trying to lock you in in that sense we're trying to say we are providing a valuable service, which you really don't 
want to get into. It's just a waste of your time. I, I love it. That, you know, open source gives you so many different choices. You have the control of the choices you have about what you run, how you build your platform. And in fact, some of our SaaS options are just giving you additional choices for how you can run yeah. that, which seems very exactly. consistent. Yeah. So are we looking as we roll into 2024, any changes? Uh, so many companies have gone to an open core model or other things. Are there any big changes in the way we think about or act on open source coming up in 2024? So simple answer is absolutely not. Uh, let me elaborate on that. So yeah, the, the commercial open source era came into being maybe in about 2010 or so. And pretty much, you know, when we started in 2005, open source was the bad guy, basically. You know, we, and we were the good guy. We, we were positioning like, you know, there's this big, bad, ugly, corporate, proprietary stuff. Hey, we are the good guys. We are open source, right? And so those guys would say, what is this nonsense, right? This is not real, and so forth. That's over. Uh, in fact, Microsoft is probably the largest contributor to open source now. And at the time, Microsoft was one of the people who said, absolutely not touching open source. So the world has evolved significantly. At the same time, commercial and, and venture investment interest in open source took off as a result. And unfortunately, sometimes when you throw too much money at a problem, you don't do any good to it, you may do harm to it. So that has happened in the open source era. We saw several of our competitors changing licenses, announcing all kinds of stuff, because they, they became very big companies by just throwing a lot of money at it and giving away stuff. But at the same time, they are not sustainable companies because they have gone into negative execution, basically you know, losing a ton of money while may, they make money, but they lose more than what they make. So that's, uh, that kind of behavior is no longer practical. But we have taken a much more pragmatic, much more slow and steady wins a race mode of operation. We are a profitable business. We are very, very committed to keeping the open source aspects that we have because it's something that has worked for us. And we are not greedy. We are not trying to get too much from the customer. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to facilitate um, others to build on top of us. Uh, for, the, for the almost 800 subscription customers we have, we know we have easily 8,000, maybe 18,000, 25,000 customers. Uh, corporations using our software free of charge. And we are okay with that. And is it part of our corporate strategy to try and go to those open source users and, and turn them into paying customers? Uh, we don't need to make them into paying customers, but we certainly would appreciate if they want to come and talk about what they do. You know, there is a payback you can do for something you get. It doesn't have to be in the form of money. It can be other forms. So we had this program some time ago where we were asking people, hey, give us a case study. Tell us what you're doing with it. So we certainly encourage that. We want to see people come and talk about it and give, give us the help because we have to keep on maintaining it. Software suffers, uh, as you know, from this concept called bit rot, right? When you write a piece of code and you commit it, it works today, and you lend B and you come back six months later, six years later, you can't even compile it anymore because the environment has changed. The hardware has changed, the software has changed. So software requires constant um, hand-holding and just nurturing and keeping it going. That costs money. Somebody's got to do that. So if you are getting something for free, that is because somebody else is investing into it. So there are ways of contributing, which is not only about making a payment. Of course, we're happy if somebody wants to pay us. We're not going to complain. We are a business. We need to make money. Uh, but that is not the only way in which we want our open source users to become community members. Mm -hmm. So are there other things our open source users can do to help encourage and nurture and sustain this community around open source software? Yeah, uh, first of all, you can submit a patch. You can submit, you can send a patch for a documentation, for a piece of code. If you find a problem, you can make it better. You can come up with suggestions. You can write a blog saying we are building this wonderful thing. We're using this open source stuff. And that helps us because there are other companies who want to use open source software, but for various reasons, they absolutely want to pay for it you know, including compliance reasons. In many uh, compliance-oriented businesses, you're not allowed to use software which is not supported. So if it's not, if we don't have a commercial agreement with the user, that means we are not uh, committed to supporting it. We do give free support, both in the form of answering questions on the internet, plus uh, if there are major security problems, CV level nine or above, we give it free to everybody because that's part of our ethical responsibility of being a software provider saying, hey, if the world's about to fall apart, um, because his software is hacked badly, we can't just say, well, haha, you're not paying, right? It doesn't work like that. So, so there are ways in contributing. So I, I would say to start off by, you know, 
telling the world that you use it. Yeah, so that word of mouth is really Absolutely. actually quite valuable. That's a powerful marketing weapon. We, we started competing with IBM and Oracle purely through word of mouth, right? No marketing budget that comes anywhere near a fraction of what they spend, even today. Yeah, and in fact, as a, as a company, um, a lot of times we don't seem to be as visible as some of the other players in the market. And a lot of that is, you know, our marketing budgets are fairly minimal because of the word of mouth aspect is the most effective way for us. Yeah, it's a, it's a double-edged sword as always. Uh, some of our competitors, Apigee, uh, which is one of our IP management competitors, when they went public, they were about $40 billion in ARR. They had like another $40 million in losses. Right? And they had raised uh, $275 million or something at the time. Uh, we, we are, we are, last year we ended at $89 million in ARR, we are profitable. And we've raised a total primary capital of less than seventy-five million dollars over the years, right? They, so what that means is they had a lot more, you know, to use a VC term, dry powder, to apply towards building brand. So we don't have that kind of a capital available for us to do that, and that's not been our strategy. That wasn't our strategy of saying let's do a, you know, slash and burn approach to building this up. Let's do it much more fitting in and kind of going with the market approach. And because we are here for the long term, we're not interested in, you know, building something, making a little bit of money and then selling it to somebody else in an unsustainable form. Yeah, absolutely. Great products that have broad reach and great impact on the market. And then the and business will that's thrive right. on and slug it out long term, mm-hmm. right? Great. Well, thanks so much for sitting down with us and uh, we Hope you'll enjoy the rest of the presentations in our open source conference.